we'll worship this morning. Let's, uh, let's stand as we get started. Take a minute. Turn around and holler at somebody or wave at them. church this morning, we had the radio on, and that uh, praise song, Holy Spirit, you are welcome here, came on. Beautiful song, has such a wonderful meaning. Without the presence of the Holy Spirit, we might well just be sitting around the table eating hot dogs and talking, but we want him to join us today. Let's pray together as we begin this time of worship. Brother Ed Bailey, lead our prayer, please.
Sing along with us this morning. I tell.
Uh, your high place, and Father, we're so thankful that you cared so much for us. And Father, I pray today as we uh, lift our praises up to you, that Father, we'll do just that, that we'll, from our heart, praise you. And Father, that you'll be glorified, that you'll be lifted up the way that you're supposed to be. Lord, I pray this morning for Brother Paul as he gets ready to preach, that you'll just give him the words that you have us here. Holy Spirit, we do invite you into this place. Pray that you would do your work among your people today. Just convict hearts. Father, help us to be sensitive to your Holy Spirit. And Father, help us to be uh, pliable to him also. Lord, just go with us this morning. Forgive us of our sin and forgive us of our wrongdoing. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Are you tired of Gideon? Don't say yes, because i got one more sermon after today. I'm going to preach about Gideon, all right? I only intended to do three, but it's kind of more than more. I told Becky, I said, I'm going to try to cut this sermon down. And I want you all to know, I really do try. It doesn't always work, but I try, okay? But I did kind of whittle this thing down to where I think it's a little more manageable. Gideon the fighter. This is the ninth sermon we preached in this series. I want to tell you just a little bit of backdrop of what this message is about and how God led Gideon to where he is. We talked about Gideon. You know about Gideon's call. You know about Gideon putting out the fleece. And now we see Gideon coming to this time when he's actually going to go to battle with Israel against the Midianites. This is a sermon about spiritual warfare. Next slide, please. It's about spiritual warfare. Uh, I think a lot of people don't realize that where we're living on this earth is a spiritual battleground. If you don't know that, you need to read Ephesians chapter 6. And he says in verse number 12 of that chapter that we wrestle not against, watch this, look at me, against flesh and blood. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. Say it with me. Against flesh and blood. But against principalities, powers, the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. I want to tell you today, ladies and gentlemen, that we're living in a nation, in a world that is divided. And a lot of people think that it's a political battle. And we have people who are politically divided. It's such a debate going on. I'm not talking about the presidential or vice presidential debate. I'm talking about, listen, I'm talking and preaching to God's children today. And God's children are divided over politics. Right. I'll tell you something. You have a right to believe what you want to believe. You have a right when it comes to political beliefs and stands. To be where you are. But it doesn't mean, listen, that he agrees with you. You have to hate him. It doesn't mean you have to be mean to him. By the way, this ain't in my notes anymore. The Lord has been up about one o'clock this morning fixing my stomach, and he and I came to agree about the things I was going to say to him, alright? But we're divided. Churches, families divided politically. And then there's personal divisions that affect us, alright? It affects us personally in our own lives, and it affects our families. Paul said to the church at Corinth, he said, when I wrote unto you, I could, write, I could not write unto you 
as of the spirit, but as of the carnal, you are babies in Christ. And he went on to say, for there is among you, listen to this, envy, division, and strife. I will tell you something today when they want to be Christ, ladies and gentlemen. The battle will kill the church. Amen. It will destroy an organization. So listen, it's a spiritual battle. And it's risky to go on and on. Life is a battleground, not a playground. We, we, we look at it like that sometimes. Uh, like Gideon, God sends us into the battle. If God wanted to teach Gideon to depend on him, I'm going to lose all your God wanted to motivate Gideon. He needed to do something to build Gideon up spiritually, not emotionally, but spiritually to the point where Gideon would learn to depend on him. You know, I heard a story years ago. Dick Dinger told the story. It was about a man named Grant Kemp. Anybody remember who Grant Kemp was? Grant Kemp was supposed to the Bay Bears back in the great days of the Southwest Conference, all right? He's also a Baptist deacon. And uh, they were playing Darrell Raw and the Texas Longhorns for the Conference Championship to see who would go to the Cotton Bowl. And, and the Longhorns had an outgun. I mean, the odds makers were getting there and all the players like that margin. So Greg Camp was a great motivator and a great motivational speaker. So he tried to find something to do that would motivate his team. So during his pregame speech, he told a story about these two old men who used to go fishing all the time. They didn't fish together, they just fished in the same place. They didn't know one another, but they were always watching one another and observing who was catching fish. Well, there was one of the older men, and he always caught more fish than the other guy. So finally, one day, the other guy, he couldn't get to anymore, and he just laid down his soul, and he walked over there and said, look, I've been watching you, you've been watching me, you catch more fish. And I do. He said, I want to know what your secret is. And the old man looked at him and his lips were kind of tight. And he said, You've got to keep the mind warm. <laughs> so Brad Camp heard that story. He sent one of his grad assistants down to a bake shop and bought a box of worms. And he had to clean those worms up. I mean, he soaked them in alcohol. They were good and dead and they were good and clean. And he got up and he told that story about the worms and the chicken. And he took out that box of worms and he took the lid off and he reached it out on his head and put the worm. And he opened his mouth and he popped that worm in his mouth and stuck it over to the side and he said, I'll keep the worms warm. <laughs> he said his offensive right back with his eyes just blazed over. <laughs> he said, take it, dude, take it, take it. This story. I'll say I'm not going to eat worms because I'm not going to eat worms. God did something entirely different to prepare and to motivate Gideon. He knew what it would take to make Gideon totally dependent on him. What we're going to see today. In this message, not exactly what God did. But I want you to know, I want this to be personal. God knows exactly what it's going to take to make you totally dependent on Him. And I will tell you, there are many who are listening to me today, on live and on Facebook live, who are too self-sufficient. You think you can do it on your own. You think you can solve all of your problems. You think you can resolve all the difficulties of life. But I want to tell you today, church, that there's coming a day when you're not going to be able to stand on your own. There will be nothing, did you hear me? Nothing you can do except depend on God. That's what God wanted you to do. Well, we're going to look at the whole last chapter, but I'm going to read the first seven verses. 
So you follow along with every one of us. Gideon, uh, Judges chapter 7, verse number 1. Then Jeroboam, by the way, I finally looked that up. It means Baal who contends. And so God renamed him Jeroboam, and he's the one that's going to fight Baal. He's not just fighting the Midianites. Remember, our, our battle is not flesh and blood. Our battle is spiritual. He's fighting Baal. Jeroboam was Gideon. And all the people who were with him rose up early and pitched beside the well of Herod. So that the host of the Midianites were on the north side of them, while the hill of Moray in the valley. You remember Gideon had blown the trumpet earlier. And in blowing the trumpet, many of the tribes sent forth warriors, and we see how many showed up. And the Lord said to Gideon, the people who are with thee are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands. Lest Israel vaunt themselves against me, saying, my own hand has saved me. So God was working on pride here, all right? By the way, 32,000 had showed up at the sound of the battle of the trumpet. Now therefore, verse 3, go to, get with it, do it quick. Proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, Whoever is fearful and afraid, let him return and depart early from Mount Gilead. And there returned of the people 22,000, and there remained 10,000. And I can imagine Gideon being the man that he was, afraid, doubtful. He probably said again, Oh my Lord, what are we going to do now? All right. That may be what he was thinking. All right. So then the Lord said unto Gideon, the people are yet too many. Bring them down under the water, and I will try them. This is the test. I will try them for thee there. And it shall be that of whom I say unto thee, this shall go with thee, this shall go with thee. And of whomsoever I say unto thee, this shall not go with thee, the same shall not go. So he brought down the people under the water. You know this. And the Lord said to Gideon, And everyone that lacketh of the water with his tongue, as the dog lacketh, him shalt thou set by himself. Likewise, everyone that bowed down upon his knees to drink. So to do. And put the number of them that left, putting their hands in their mouth, were three hundred men. But all the rest of the people bowed down upon their knees to drink water. And the Lord said unto Gideon, By the hand of three Hundred men that laugh will I save you and deliver the Midianites into thy hand, and let all of the other people go every man unto his place. May God bless this word to us today. I want you to look first of all this morning about how God prepared Gideon for the battle. God wanted Gideon, not only Gideon, but the army. To depend completely and totally on him. When, when Israel pitched and looked over a million over to the north of them, there were 42,000 against 135,000, plus the camels, plus their chariots, all right? So Gideon already knew he was out going. So God says, look, Gideon. He said, Gideon was already thinking, men, they're too big for us. And God said, no, Gideon, you're too big for me. Did you hear that? You're too big for me. So God started swindling down the army. And he, he didn't leave Gideon in the dark as to why he was doing this. In verse number two, he said, bless Israel, haunt themselves again. You know, I think it's, it's amazing I want you to get this. Pride is what keeps us from doing what God is telling us to do. Get rid of pride. Pride is one of the great things. The Bible says only by pride can you get to the But listen, God viewed pride as more of a peril to Israel, P-E-R-I-L, peril to Israel, than he did the Midianites. 
Did you see that? Sometimes we think all of our enemies are out there. But most often, our enemies are inside. And we focus not on ourselves and what we need to do and what we need to be. And we're looking at the other and saying, oh, that's our enemy. But God wants to know that the enemy started inside them. So how did God reduce the army of Gideon? Well, he gave them, it was first of all, a test of faithfulness. And then we're back to chapter 6, when, when the battle comes down it, and the 32,000 showed up. And then, I, I will say something about that. Out of all the people that, that heard, because after the trial went out, after people knew that God had spoken to Gideon, after people knew that God was working to Gideon, seven years they have been already out of prison. And you would have thought, listen, you would have thought that Israel could have fielded an army of more than 32,000 men. You want to know why more didn't show up? I'll tell you why. Because they were afraid. It was fear that kept them. By the way, in Deuteronomy chapter number 20, part of the Israelites, for, for the Old Testament, first chapter 5, verse of the Bible, God told them how to go in the battle. This is what it says. <laughs> he said, Deuteronomy 21, when you go out to battle against your enemies, and you see horses and chariots and people more than you, do not be afraid of them. Why? Because the Lord thy God is with you who has brought you out of the land of Egypt. 32,000 knew that. But there were thousands more who stayed at home because they were afraid. I'm telling you, listen, fear is contagious. I know the churches who have said, become dormant, and eventually died because, listen, they were afraid to change. I have heard some people who are older than me in the ministry, and they said this, and I said, I said change is a four-letter word in the name. We like it, like it is, and we don't want to change anything or adapt. But I want to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, we make it. We're never going to change what we preach. We're never going to change what we believe. But sometimes our methods have to change. We have to adapt to reach more people. And I know, listen, I used to look around at those people that got tired of hearing them, but well, we didn't do it that way when I was younger. Well, guess what? I'm one of them now. And we don't do it that way when I was younger. We have to adapt. Sometimes we'll have to change. There have always been those who have been timid about going forward and trying to take steps of faith in the Lord. And then this, this next step was the test I'll call a curve. Okay? It was the first one eliminate those who were fearful of going hard. And this test I like to take a little bit to those who were careless and lacked caution. Alright? It was simple. He said, first of all, you, you were afraid to go home. 22,000 went home to the other team. And God says, you bring the 10,000 down the water. By the way, the indicators of what I learned, I've never heard this until I was prepared for this message. The commentators, the theologians, the scholars, they believe that where Gideon brought these 10,000 men down to the water to drink, they could see the Gideon. And the many not to be able So that will make this test even more. So he says, I want you to come down to the water to get a drink. And over there in the north, they can see the many of us. They can see the multitudes of them. They can see their chariots. They can see their horses. And many of them, they came down, they laid down their weapons, they laid down their sword, they laid down their shield, and they got down on their faces, and they left water like a dog. Boy, I tell you, I've never done water with them. And you have that your business. I don't know that. God, hell, dog. And we drink, we have to go in and mop up after you, okay? If you've ever had a beat, you know what I mean. So there were 9,700 who got down on the sections and left like a dog. And there were 300 who at least kept the sword or shield in their hand. And they picked the water up in their hand and they sipped it out of their hand because they were alert. They were cautious. And they were watching. They knew the enemies out there. They could see the enemy out there. 
They knew what was ahead of them in the battle, but only 300 were fervent, committed wholeheartedly to the battle and had their game face on. So this was a test of their fervency. So God brought Gideon the whole hearted confidence in him. Let me read it. Let me just read two verses to you, all right? It, it's in chapter 7 again, but, but, but listen to these verses. Verse 9, chapter 7. And it came to pass to say, not that the Lord said in the Gideon, or I get them out of the host. I have delivered it into your hands. But if you fear to go down, go with Purah, my servant, to the host. So now, listen. He's down to 300. And God said, hey, Gideon, I got some help on the Lord Jesus, all right? By the way, by now, Gideon's not that, uh, hold on a second. Lord, I'm not going to put the recruit down. She don't want to make me do that. And, and the ground dry, all right? He said, I want you to take the southern if you're afraid, and you go down into the host of the Midianite army. Just two of them. Just Gideon and Pure. And I want you to hear what they say. By the way, I think sometimes it would be good for us to know what the enemy is. Did you hear that? I don't think he wanted us sometimes. I don't think I wanted us sometimes. What they're saying about it. But I want to tell you something, ladies and gentlemen. Look at me. Church, if they're laughing at us, we're not doing it right. right. I know we need to preach the truth. We need to stand for the truth. We need to preach the heaven and the will. Tell us off. The only way out of it is Jesus Christ. And in truth is Jesus Christ. But I'm telling you, we need to learn to show grace to those who stumble and fall in the world. Did you give me any of verse 2? So hear what they say. And afterwards, shall your hands be stripped to go down to the host. So he went down with Pure and his servant under the outside of the army that were in the host. So he's kind of on the outside of the east. Yes, Lord. And the many lives of the Amalekites and all the children of Israel lay on the valley like that prophets and multitudes. And their camels were without number. By the way, did he see them all this? As the sand of the seaside from multitudes. So that's like the descriptive term. So you don't feel like that. Like grasshoppers were the men, uh, like uh, standing by the seaside with the skin. So verse 13. So when Gideon was come, behold, there was a man that met him. He doesn't know who Gideon is. There was a, there was a man that told him a dream under his cell and said, Behold, I dreamed a dream. And a cake of barley bread tumbled into the host of Midian. And came into the tent and smote it as well, and overturned it, and the tent lay along. And his fellow, so give him no hearing. And his fellow answered and said, This is nothing else save the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, the man of Israel. For into his hand has God delivered Gideon and all the host. How do you think of Gideon, Bill, when he heard that? These were the enemies, all right? And they're talking. Did they not have a dream? A barley cake came down the sword of the sin. And, 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 and it's about Gideon. It's about that crowd there. He don't know that they've only got 300. They don't know how many people God's got. And by the way, they don't know that God's got an unseen army that's working for us every day. And you wasn't mad that you just said about that. Right? My verse 15, so so. When Gideon heard the telling of his name in the first place of their a lot of response. Gideon worshiped. Gideon worshiped. God gave Gideon confidence in not himself, but in God. And then God prepared Gideon for the future. Now we'll talk about the performance in the past, alright? We'll talk about how they were doing in the past. We didn't read the rest of it on this territory, all right? So God told Gideon, here's what I want you to do. By the way, listen, if you'll tune in and you hear what God has to say to you, if you'll put away your pride and your stubbornness, God will tell you how to fight with that. He will, all right? He said, I want you to take these 300 men, I want you to divide them into three companies. He gave each a man a trumpet, a pitcher, 
but you did this by fire. A torch that was covered with pitch or some substance, and he told us, get ready to make a battle fire. Now the important thing here is not what he gave them, although it was going to come into play, play psychologically in the war with many and I. But the important thing was here, God was speaking to Gideon, and God was speaking through Gideon. Are you watching that? So God had something to say not only to Gideon, but God had something to say to them. You know, I think it's amazing sometimes. People come by after preaching, preaching, I'm not just talking about you, because I'm pretty guilty of that last time, all right? So, but preaching, preaching, people come by, and, and I've, heard, I've had it happen, I know there's no joke about this, but people say, well, you gave it to them today. Did you catch that? You gave it to them. Maybe I wasn't preaching to them. Maybe God was speaking to you. And our problem is we're focused on what? So God was speaking to Gideon. God was speaking through Gideon. So the timing of this attack was, was very important. It would take place in the middle of the night. The time of darkness was a time of distraction because Gideon was able to go right into their camp, all right? It was also key for many not from discovering the size of Gideon's army. So it would also give them an element of surprise as they came down to the camp. And if you know the rest of the story, God used every one of those elements and every one of those things, he separated them, all right? He told them all to shout. All right? He told them all to blow their trumpets. They thought they were surrounded by the armies of Israel. They didn't know there were only 300 of them. So they blew the trumpet. They drove the pictures and, and, and the, the, the torches were inside. They were covered up. They were under darkness at that time. And when they shouted a battle shout, they shouted a war cry, and you know what happened? Somebody tell me the rest of the story. Huh? They killed each other. They were so confused. They were so discombobulated. They didn't know who was who. And they killed one another. By the way, I think it is both good, but I think God did better. Amen. I like this. Verse 21 of chapter number 7. And they stood every man in his place, number about the kingdom, and the whole friend and tried and said, I love the last word of the man, and tried to make way. I don't know what the difference between running and fleeing is, but that's just a clean capacity, okay? Well, I don't know what they're going to take it back. I like that phrase, every man stood in his place. The place of God's army in the battle. Firm in one place. They just stood there. They stood there with their torches. They stood there with their trumpets. And they stood there and watched. This is me, look at me. They watched God fight the battle for them. God calls the Midianites to slay one another. They begin to panic, running, crying. Killing their own men. Then verse 20, the Lord said, Every man sword against his fellow. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 6, we are not talking about spiritual warfare. And over three times it's mentioned in this passage. It says over and over and over again. Stand there for. Having done all to stand, stand. And the problem I see with many of us today is, is we're too weak to stand, but we have enough energy to run. We're trying to solve our problems on our own, and all God wants us to do is be in place and stand. We're going to every man stood. Well, there's something happened after the fact, and you probably don't know about it unless you've read that very during the battle, two of the princes of Midian escaped. Along with some of their soldiers, so Gideon had sent word for the Ephraimite to walk away. The Ephraimite had even come in the battle, but he kind of worked for the next few So they did, they walked away of these two uh, Midianite princes, and their armies were with them. 
And the Israelites stopped them along the way to kill them in a simple question. I want you to look at the Bible in the chapter 8 of the book of 1 and 2 3, all right? And the men of Ephraim said unto him, so, so they promised what, what he had even told them to do, all right? And the men of Ephraim, by the way, they didn't show up when the battle cry on the wood for the time. And the men of Ephraim said, Why hast thou, why hast thou served us? Why have you treated us this way? He didn't call us. He didn't tell us when he went to fight with the Midianites. And they did try with him shortly. My foot. If they said that to me, you know what I would do. I know you know me since I was in my way. I just blow you up right here. That's my place. But Gideon didn't respond in that life. And Gideon said unto them, What have I done to compare to the what he said? He spoke the greatest experience. He, he, he extended God's grace to them. Is not the gleaning of the grave of Ephraim? Better than the penny of the visor? And in verse number three, he says, So God hath delivered into your hands the pestilence of me, for it and thee. And what was I able to do in comparison of you? Then their anger was abated toward him, for he was dead. You know, I don't think I would have enough grace. I don't think I would have enough thought to accept what he did. But I want to tell you what it proves. It proves God has done the work in you. It proves God has, 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 has worked on you. We'll go to that verse of Proverbs and I'll close with it or begin to close. Proverbs 16 32 says, He that is slow to anger is better than the mighty. And he that ruleth his spirit is better than he. When the wise man wrote that, he should have talked about Gideon and did it. I don't know what battle you're fighting, but I know you're fighting that. I know that, that if you're a child of God, unless you just totally sit down and drop down, and you're not involved in a spiritual race for God, I'm telling you today that you're in battle. But I want to remind you again, the battle is not with one another. The battle is not with flesh and blood. The battle is against Satan. The battle is against Baal. The same evil, demonic spirit that led those people into idolatry are the same evil, demonic spirit that's leading our world into idolatry today. And I'll tell you something, you may not like it. The Republicans can't say that. I said the Republicans can't say that. And the Democrats can't save us. Yeah. And the socialists can't save us. Right. Listen, there's a soul on Facebook. Our hope is not in a donkey. Our hope is not in an elephant. Our hope is in the Lamb of God. Amen. I think there are people here today who need to come to the altar and pray. And you need to turn your struggle over to God. <laughs> And let God begin to work in your life. But I want to tell you, if you should, and I don't know who you are. I'm not throwing out anyone in the business. But if you don't, do as God wants you to do. I can tell you what I'm doing. You want me to tell you what? It goes back to that verse. God said he didn't want Israel to walk themselves up. He didn't want them to walk around in pride. He wanted them to go. And you're not willing to give it to God, turn it over to God, to depend on God, whatever it is, it's going to be your pride or your fear. You have to make up your mind in that way. If you're here this morning and you've never been saved by God's name, you pray. I'm telling you, it's pride and fear is going to keep you from walking down this aisle for a moment. I need to be saved. I don't know what I'm going to do. Heavenly Father, teach us to be what we need to be and to do what you want us to do. And be what we need to be. All of this, you know, I want us to say.